If you would find James chapter 3, we're going to wrap up something from last week. And no point in getting in a hurry. We plan on being here till Jesus comes, right? While you're turning, I'd like to mention those purple cards in front of you. Prospect cards. We've only gotten two or three, maybe four turned in. Um, during the summer, we're, we're wanting to, uh, to go prospect hunting. And if there's someone that you know, work, neighborhood, you've got, you've got to give us some kind of an address, something, you know, at least behind the big tree that, you know, they've got the red truck in the driveway and then the guy's name is Bill. Um, we'll go call on them. And what we'd like you to do is uh, somebody that God lays on your heart and fill out whatever you can on this and then you start praying for them each day. If it's a teenager, that's fine. We'll send some youth workers or we'll send some teenagers by. And uh, if you turn in a card, you're making a commitment to start praying for that person. And then we will uh, go follow up. By the way, uh, I had a card uh, somebody turned in and I gave it to Caleb Beal. And he said they got saved and baptized the week before. That is fast. That's, that's, because God answers prayer before, I mean, God knows you were going to pray that prayer, right? And so I, I have no idea. But anyway, um, so uh, if you, if you have a prospect and name, um, somehow we've got to keep our heart tender toward people. There's no hope in this world without Christ. And the world stinks anyway. So, we, you know, we're not trying to get people a wonderful life here on earth. This world is a mess, sickness and disease and unemployment. And, and I, I love life and it's okay to enjoy your life. But, you know, there's a lot of grief here. There's a lot of hurt. And, and, uh, and then, there's, then there's Democrats and, and, um, and we love them. Amen. The Bible says to love the feeble-minded. And, um, and, and uh, then there's Republicans. And they're even worse. And so what a mess our world is. And I'm so glad we've got the Lord. But we're not getting saved for this life. I don't want someone saved so they can have this perfect world here on earth. If you've not followed the good pastors, their little boys got that tumor. And the uh, Jeremy Pinero's daughters had three surgeries on her ear. And she's probably, she's seven years old, going to be deaf in one ear. And, and uh, our missionaries carry the same burdens you do, only they carry it in a third world country and they're far from home and they've got burdens. And, and uh, you know, when our work is a little slim, we can go work at finding work, but a missionary can't. You know, they're 10,000 miles from home and they can't, they can't work. It's against the law in these other countries from the work. So, but anyway, we should care. And this is one way to care. Understand people need to be saved. People need to be saved. They've just got to get saved or they're not going to see heaven. And uh, being good's not enough. Look at Proverbs with me, Proverbs chapter 10. And we didn't get to one point last week that I want to make sure we get to tonight. And uh, I don't believe you can talk too much about the tongue. But look there with me. We're in Proverbs chapter 10. And look down at verse 13. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. Now, uh, we're going to go to James 3 in just a moment. But, but picture this. The person who in the lips of him that hath understanding, if you've got some understanding, if you're in your lips, see, understanding in your words, care in your words. You don't hold understanding like you hold a piece of chocolate. Um, it's something that is shown through your speech. So in the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. When you talk, when your speech exhibits understanding, that person will find wisdom. It's a cause and effect thing. Now with, with, with that, just as a brief introduction, I can't spend as much time on this as I'd like to, but uh, hold that place and look over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, almost to the last book of your Bible. Uh, Hebrews, James, and 1st, uh, 2nd, 3rd, John, Jude, Revelation. But look at James chapter 3. Then we're going to go back to, Hebrew, to uh, Proverbs 10. But I want to talk a little bit this, this evening about your words and the power of your words and why, why we ought to guard our speech. Many of us, I would say my age and older especially, we were taught to control our words. You were not allowed to vent. You weren't allowed to stomp your feet. 
you weren't allowed to argue you weren't allowed to answer back well you could answer back and then you'd be picking yourself up off your back um, this uh, you know the, the we're in a we're in a messed up world today but there's a reason that in years gone by we were taught to control our words look at Proverbs chapter 3 and look down at verse 3 behold we put bits in the horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body so you put a bit in a horse's mouth that little bit in that mouth so that you can turn the whole 800 000, 1200 pound horse that one little piece of leather hooked to the bit controls the whole body of the horse he goes on and gives us another illustration verse 4 behold also the ships which though they be so great are driven of fierce and and are driven of fierce winds yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth so you got this big ship and there's wind blowing and storms raging and the ships being blown the wind is blowing that way and a wise sailor can tack back and forth and actually move that ship against the storm and can control the storm and how it breaks against the waves. And so you find in the horse, the whole body of the horse is turned by its mouth, by that little bit. You find in a ship, there's a guy at the helm, the, the steering wheel, the, there's a little rudder down there in the water and it's, it's controlled by the, by the helm, the steering wheels we would call it. And so this guy's turning the steering wheel and he can control this huge ship and the whole thing is turned by this one thing. The destiny, the direction of the horse, the, the cadence often of the horse, and the direction of the ship, even against great opposition, it is controlled by that very small helm. Now look at the, the next verse, verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things, Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it, the tongue, it is set on fire of hell. Now, here's the principle. What you let your tongue say will determine what the rest of you does. That's why you should be guarded in relationships. You young people that, that you get around guys and girls, or just guys and guys, be very careful what you talk about. Don't talk for, forward. Don't talk indiscreet. Don't talk inappropriate. Uh, you adults, don't let somebody at work start casually dropping comments that are indiscreet comments. Don't let those words, because those words are like the bit in the horse's mouth, and they're going to turn their whole body or like the helm on the ship. You let some words or some, some, some comments or some jokes or some innuendos and you let them start going. And pretty soon like the helm of the ship, the whole giant ship is being turned by what? By the words, by the things that are allowed to be said. Uh, I had a cousin years ago, we were little and and in our home, you did what you said or you're dead. There were seven of us and only two lived. But, um, but um, and he, the idea of answering back a parent was just out of the question. But uh, we were in, in Iowa visiting relatives. And, and I remember one of my cousins, my uncle, said something to my cousin, go do this. And he didn't want to do it. And he said, I don't want to do it. And I'm, I'm not going to do it. And he's walking away, stomping his feet, yelling, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to. Well, his dad's laughing because he's doing it while he's saying you know it's kind of like I may be obeying outside but inside I'm not but you know what that tongue turns the whole body that's why I've never been real I'm not I'm thinking think it's a sin but I've never been in favor of all night you know overnight parties sleepovers now if we were out of town we need to put our kids somewhere we have people in this room have had our kids all night um it's not a sin to do it but but for uh, you know four or five six girls to all get together and have a all night they're just going to sit up all night and eat and drink and play and cut up they're going to say something they shouldn't say 
Say, how do you know? Because they're girls. They are. And you let some boys have an all-night thing, they're going to say some they shouldn't say it. How do you know? Because they're boys. And boys are corrupt. They go astray from the womb, speaking lies. Uh, we're, we're just bad by nature. And again, if you do that, and it's, it's totally up to you as a parent what you want to do. But I just don't trust kids. I'm very careful who and what and how long and what you can do clean and decent for an hour. You can't do clean and decent for five hours. The time just gets going and, and, and your, words, your words start going where they shouldn't go and things start being said and you start getting silly and then you start getting stupid and then you start getting sinful. And, uh, and, and you know, in, in an office, uh, I love the staff. I've always had the best uh, staff. And the ladies in our office have always been so appropriate. The last thing I need is a casual, um, too familiar secretary. And I've never had that in all these years. been so good, uh, the staff we've had. Because I'm there, we're there together day after day and year after year. We've got to keep those boundaries of propriety. Now, you go in the office where the, the girls are down the hallway and it's giggle city. But they're not in my office giggling. You know, they're just, I don't want them giggling around me. Giggle down there when we're in the women's area. But we have a segregated office. Not, not really, but I, I like, our, by the way, I like our office happy. I like to hear laughter. I like to hear children laughing. And I love to, I, lo I think we'll enjoy life. But, but when it's someone that I'm not married to, there needs to be a little, de some decorum, a little bit of, of reserve there because it's just logical. If you go back there where you were uh, to Proverbs chapter 10, let's look at that verse again. He says in, the, in, in Proverbs 10, in verse 13, in, the, in the, the lips, Proverbs 10, 13, in the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. The person whose words are words of understanding, words of care, words of discretion. You're a dating couple. There are things you should not talk about. Well, I like this person. Yeah, but until you're married, you shouldn't talk about them. There are things, and uh, I'm just giving you, we got college students home, but there's, there in, in the process of a relationship, you're, you like each other here, there are some things you absolutely should not venture into. Some words, there's vocabulary you shouldn't use. And as you get closer, and uh, you, you like each other more, and parents are okay with it, then there's maybe a little bit more some things that you might allow to be said. Well, you know, I love you should not be in the, in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th graders vocabulary. Unless it's to grandma. Say, don't you think they can love people? Yeah, they can love their grandma. You, you say, I love you to my teenage daughter, you'll never see her again. Say, how are you going to control that? I'm taking your eyes out. Now, you, you get up toward engagement, say, I love you. But there's still things you ought not talk about. And you get closer to a wedding, you probably ought to talk about, are we going to have children and, 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 and things along those lines and how many and what are we going to do with your parents and all those things. But, but there are things back here should not be talked about. Why? Because your words will lead you somewhere. And that's one of the things that's so wrong about the music of today. Not of today, good grief, the music when I was in high school. Music that's suggestive and, and inappropriate and talks about things that shouldn't be said in public. That's what's wrong with a lot of Disney, by the way, not just other movies and cartoons. A lot of Disney stuff, they talk about things they shouldn't talk about. And, and our, our rule at camp will do this, at children's camp, at teen camp, any youth activity. My rule is if you do it with the door shut or you put clothes on it, you shouldn't talk about it. Say why? Because where your lips lead you somewhere, just like the bridle on a horse, just like the helm of a ship. And, and you might say, well, it's just a little thing. That helm's just a little thing. Guard your words. And could I say, that's why you should never express words of anger and hatred toward your spouse. You shouldn't have the luxury of griping about your spouse, complaining about your spouse. Oh, and you know, you're some guys at work or some ladies hanging around at work or wherever. And you, you start letting the words flow negative toward you. Don't do that. Don't go there. Why? Because you're, you're going to steer your whole life. 
The whole course of nature is set on fire by that wicked tongue of ours. And if we do not learn to control our words, we will not be able to control the body because where the words go, that's why we don't want, man, don't let your kids text all these, especially boys and girls. Don't. So how do you control it? Take away their phone. Get them a phone where you have, where every text your child sends or gets goes to your phone. And the first time one's appropriate, you take a nail and drive it through their phone and then give it back to them. Say, I have no problem with you having a phone as long as the nail is through the middle of it. Say, man, you must be an ogre. Yeah, and so far, so good. I'm, I'm, I'm up for ogre of the year. Uh, I've got no problem being an ogre rather than losing my kids. And, uh, man, we've got to learn to, you know, it's an amazing thing. Um, we're outlawing fist fights, tackle football, and guns, but we're letting people be perverts. You know, bring back football, fist fights in the school playground, and guns. I got no problem with a little violence. The world needs a little violence. Yeah, that's just my opinion. All right, okay, it's not Bible. But um, it's the right opinion, though. <laughs> I was listening to this sermon. This guy said, now look, we know it's not just Baptists going to heaven. He said, my dear pastor, he's a Presbyterian, and he sprinkled me when I was a baby. He's a godly man. He was saved, and he's in heaven today, and he's also a Baptist today. <laughs> but, you know, you can have an opinion. You'll, you'll agree with me when we all get to heaven. But anyhow, but that hymn, don't, that's, that's why I can't fight with my wife. You start saying things. For one thing, you're outgunned, men. <laughs> She'll remember every single thing you've ever said or done out of line, and you'll remember one. You know, it's like, you know, you've got a bow and arrow, and they've got a supersonic jet with hellfire things, and you're dead. You just, just say, I'm sorry, honey. I'm a jerk. Why'd you marry me? You're so wonderful. And then she's not going to believe it, but it at least pacify things. Don't get in an argument. Don't do that. Uh, that's why men hit their wives, by the way, ladies. When you can't out-talk them, you punch them. And, uh, but anyway, I'm not for hitting wives either. But I do remember Mrs. Evans. Somebody called Mrs. Evans and said, Mrs. Evans, my husband hit me. And she said, what did you say? <laughs> uh, he said, How did she know she said something? Because, never mind, I'm not going to say it. But anyway. Guard your words, uh, words of criticism, words of slander, words of, of anger, words of hatred. We don't go there. I, I feel like you shouldn't complain. For one, go back to Numbers 14 sometime when the people complained, the Lord heard it and it displeased the Lord. But for another thing, look, look here, I'm, I'm the devil and I am, so, I mean, figuratively, some of you believe that. Um, I'm walking around seeking whom I may devour, right? Know what 1 Peter 5 says? As a roaring lion. And I, and I get down here, and I notice these three girls up here. They're writing notes. This is a boring church service. They're not really. I'm teasing. These are my friends up here. And the other one takes it and says, yeah, he's so old, no one knows what he's talking about. That was Trinity. <laughs> And, and so the devil comes down and says, oh, I got a little inroad in these girls. And he's going to see, he, because of their words, the devil sees their weakness. And he can start working on that. And then he sees AJ over here, and he's telling his mom, man, I'm just tired. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. And I think, oh, I'm going to work on him. You're, you know what? They work you too hard. School's too hard. Sports you too hard. Girls are certainly too hard. And I'm going to, you see, you complain enough, and what you're going to find out, you're going to find that the, the devil didn't know you were having a problem. But you announced it to him. Get up in the morning, oh, I feel horrible. This is going to be a bad day. <laughs> well, the devil's going to bring everybody from hell to visit you. I mean, all the demons in the county will be at your breakfast table. The milk will be sour. The Cheerios will spill. The banana will be brown. 
it's just going to be a bad day. And that's before you get your shoes on. Man, just get up and be on top side. And that's why the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. It doesn't mean things are always good. It means you can always rejoice in the Lord. You can always be thankful. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You can be thankful. You can rejoice. You can praise God. And you may have a sickness. You may have a burden. You may have a, a, a trial you don't know how to handle. But, but boy, don't. See, where your mouth goes, where your words go is going to turn that whole thing. Don't let your kids whine. Don't let them complain about the teacher. Don't let them complain about the coach. Don't let them complain about the referee. Leave that to the pastor and Brother Beal. We will complain about the referee enough for all of you. Um, guard, don't let your children come home and no one likes you. No one likes me. Well, you act like a jerk. <laughs> we have told kids, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. If you don't have friends, you must not be very nice. How are you acting that no one would like you? <laughs> Think, oh, you're so mean. Yeah, and I plan on staying mean. I worked awful hard. I spent a lot of money going to Bible college to learn to be mean. I intend on staying mean. Oh, you, you take that little honey bunch of yours. Oh, you poor little boy. Life's been so hard on you. And he's fat and lazy and a compromiser. He's got no convictions. He's got no grit. He's got no tenacity. He'll never be able to keep a job. He'll never face hardship. He's not going to always be able to run to mama. Yeah. Tell that boy, straighten up, you sorry little rascal, and man up. Take a shovel and go dig a ditch in the yard. What for? So you can fill it up tomorrow. And I want you singing praise God while you do it. <laughs> Don't pamper those guys and raise it. But, 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 but boys, girls, you tell you, girls are worse than boys often. But complaining is such a bad thing. Why? Because you're turning your whole body. Inappropriate talk, complaining talk, negative talk, critical talk arguing and fighting that is going to sink your ship and it and life is hard sure there's burdens and and there are times you go into the room and cry over your children but, but you know what there's a god in heaven he knows where we live and he's going to be good anyway i don't have enough time to spend the rest of the night on that we got things to do proverbs 11 you might want to take some notes on this i'm going to race through here and i mentioned this last week i want to just talk about the benefits of righteous living now i'm going to show you how to find these things and then you can go through the rest of proverbs we're just going to stay right in proverbs 11 i'm going to show you about 10 points real real quick here and we'll be gone but learn to get something out of your bible as you read it this is right out of my bible my notes from my bible reading and I'm just going to go through. These are all color-coded. I color my Bible. I never got did coloring very good in kindergarten, but I do it now. Look at Proverbs, Proverbs 11. Look at verse 4. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness. Tell me what righteousness does. Delivers. Delivers from death. So if you want to make a list of things righteousness will do, number one, righteousness will deliver you from death. All right, number two, look at verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall, what? direct this way so number one righteousness will deliver number two righteousness will direct we have got a homiletical sermon going here we've got two d's amen i never preach that way because it takes too long to find all the right words and no one remembers it anyway the only guy the only one impressed with a sermon like that is the preacher because he found all these words that start with the same letter and he doesn't know what they and he, he doesn't know what those words mean but anyhow He's going through the thesaurus for some word starting with an F that goes along with, you know, pistachio or something. Look at verse 6. The righteousness of the upright shall what? Deliver them. All right, so we already got deliver. So you can write it down again or not, but you got deliver, and then you've got direct. Look down at verse 8. The righteous is, what do we see? Delivered. Man, do you think righteousness delivers you? Three times we've got God delivering the righteous. The next time you try to decide, young people, you know, let me say a word to you teenagers. There is always a crowd, and, and, and like the thermometer, 
There's a crowd of young people scattered throughout. These kids are just on top for God. They're going to walk straight, do right, all the way down to those who are probably not saved. And they're all scattered through there. You pick your crowd. You pick your group. That's what every teenager, it's what every adult does, by the way. But I'll tell you what, the further you get up here, the more you're going to be delivered. The further you push to righteousness, why are you going to do it that way? Because it's the right way to do it. We're going to do right. You don't have to be popular. But if you want to be delivered, you ought to do right. And what's great about doing right is you've messed up there. But you know what? Start today doing right. And you're right. The, man, there's nothing as wonderful as a clean slate. Isn't it great being saved? So we've got the word deliver, and we've got the word direct in verse 4 and verse 5, and deliver two other times. Verse 8, the righteous is delivered out of trouble. So we could go to verse 4, you're delivered from death. And in verse 6, God is going to deliver you, period. In verse 8, God will deliver you out of trouble. Look at verse 10. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoices. Now we've got when righteous people, when things are going well for righteous people, cities are helped. And by the way, when the wicked are in authority, the, the people mourn. That's another verse, but we want, well, if God would give us righteous leaders, but I don't know right now if anybody righteous is running for office. But, but anyway, we'll commit it to God. Amen? So righteousness will help your whole city in verse 10. Go down a little bit further. Go down, let's just skip down to verse 18. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness. All right, so you sow righteousness, you get a what? A reward. So sowing righteousness like sowing seed in a field and you get corn or, or wheat or whatever you're, you're planting. Sow righteousness, God rewards you. Now all this is just stuff, this, this is the motivator to me. I went through all these when I was in Bible college and I wanted to be motivated to righteous living. Why is it I won't do that? Because I want to be delivered, because I want to be directed, because I want God to reward me. I want my city to rejoice. I want to be around happiness, so I'm going to do right. And so I get tempted to do wrong. No, I'm going to have trouble and sorrow and heart. I mean, there's, a little, there's trouble in life anyway. Last thing you want to do is add to it. Look on a little bit further just for the sake of time. Look down at verse 19. As righteousness tendeth to what? life. Now that word tend is like our word leans. It's, it's more likely. You're, you're, you're more prone to find these things. You see it tends to something. Righteousness tendeth to life. You do right, you're more likely to have a good life. Look, young people, listen. There are, there are people in this room, they didn't go to Bible college, they didn't go to a Christian school. They just got out of high school and got a job and got married to somebody along the way they fell in love with and they did right, they did right, they did right. Today they've got good jobs, they teach Sunday school, they've got happy homes, they've got great kids. You know, we're, everybody's not going to be a preacher. In fact, it's really good because who would pay my paycheck if all you were preachers? Uh, you know, we don't need too many Indians. We need a lot of Indians and just a few chiefs. And um, just relax. There's a place for all of you. And, and it's not, everybody's, everybody's not going to be in the ministry full time. Everybody should love God. Everybody should love people. That's a great commandment. But, but relax in this thing. Righteousness tends to life. Righteousness will kind of lean you that direction. Just keep doing right and keep doing right and keep doing right. Look at verse 21. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. But, the, no, and I love this one. And this is one of my favorites. The seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Now, now we're talking about deliverance again. Well, you know who's getting delivered now? My children. When it talks about the seed of someone, that's their kids. So I'll tell you what, Josh, Hannah, Esther, and Josiah ought to be praying their dad lives right. Because my righteousness will bring deliverance to my children. If that would not motivate you to do right when you want to do wrong, you're nuts. I want my kids blessed. I want God, when there's a car accident about to happen, I want God to just move my kid the other direction. When there's a wrong gal or a wrong guy, set their sights on them, and, you know, and they smell a sulfur and got a pitchfork in their locker at school, I want God to deliver them. And, and you understand they're out there, right? 
You adults understand this. You teenagers don't have a clue. But the devil is very capable of sowing seed in a Christian school, in a youth department, in a Christian college, in a secular college. The devil is capable of sending the most handsome, charming guy right by you in class and just happens to like you. You know, the devil is very capable of having the prettiest girl. You guys that are going to go off to college this fall and you've not had, you know, many dates or no dates and you're off in college this fall and suddenly this beautiful girl just thinks you're awesome. Don't believe her. Because you're not. <laughs> She's lying to you. You're just an old sinner like the rest of us. And when, that, when the devil's got his sights on my child, it does matter that I did right. It does matter that I turned to right instead of turning to wrong. This goes on. There's so much. There's probably, I think I've got 51 things or something. I'm, I'm not going to do them all tonight, okay? I'm going to do three more. But uh, there's a lot in the book of Proverbs. Look down to verse um, 28. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall what? flourish. How do you get the word flourish with a D? Never mind, just leave it flourish. Flourish. God wants to just make you blossom and, and do well and achieve and accomplish. And it might be ones in business and ones at some certain job and some's in this area of family and home and somebody else and whatever it might be. It, it doesn't mean the same area. It just means what you do. God is going to take that thing and run with it. Righteousness cannot be overrated. Verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Then he explains what he's talking about there. And he that winneth souls is wise. I think righteousness helps people get saved. Righteousness is, is this tree that springs forth in life. I think people, when, when we live right as a church, as a church, church members, as a church as a whole, uh, as we do right, people around us will get saved that no one ever would have been saved had it not been for that. You know, I think of the bus workers. I think it was Barry Kirk when she was single, Barry Ebenkamp back then, that met um, a neighbor of Tim and Jackie Heck and tried to get the kids to come on the bus. And that lady and Jackie Heck either rode the bus, I can't remember if they rode the bus or drove, but they came to church. And from there, we, we got Tim and Jackie's family and kids and grandkids here in church and uh, Bob and Sharon Tiller and their kids and all who, the number of people that have gotten saved because the two bus workers knocking on an apartment door could never be counted. Yep. It's, it's a tree of life. It just keeps springing here and going all over. All because somebody was doing the right thing. And righteousness, unbelief. One more verse, the last verse of the chapter, verse 31. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed. Isn't that great? That means God's going to pay you back. But don't miss the last phrase, in the earth. Now, I don't understand all this. I'm not going to say I can explain it. But I'll tell you what God says. You keep doing right, and I will pay you back. Just keep doing right. And keep doing right, doing right, and keep doing right. You young people, do right. Do right through elementary school. Do right through high school. Do right through college. Do right in your married life. And what's going to happen? God is up in heaven saying, you know what? I'm going to have to pay them back. Gabe, Gabe take this down to him. G give them that next raise. Help them get that house. Help them get that good deal on that car. Hey, that, that engine that's supposed to blow up, it's not going to blow up. It's going to go 400,000 miles. You cannot overrate righteousness and just this let it motivate you let it stir you and again back here in my world like most of you um, dumb stupid foolish I told somebody recently very everybody in our church has gone out for a hand-in-hand -hand walk with foolishness we've just done that but isn't it good it's under the blood of Christ and righteousness is where I go from here don't let, don't let the devil pick your past up and beat you with it. God forgot it. The only one bringing up your past is the devil. Kick him out. You head down the road of right. You that are going off to school, just do right. Don't let your roommates. Uh, let, be willing to turn your roommate in. I had a college student one time call me up and say, what do I do if my roommates are breaking some rules in the dorms? I said, turn them in. He said, what if it's someone from our church? I said, what difference does that make? 
Well, it makes a big difference. You know, you grew up with the person. Friends for a lifetime. So what do you do then? Turn them in and feel bad. <laughs> Why? Because righteousness brings a sure reward. And God will recompense the righteous right here in this earth. Cannot overrate doing the right thing. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Uh, may we be careful with our words and careful with righteousness in every way possible. Guide us to do the right thing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night.